I have my microphone on now. Um, first order of business is an update on the assessment vote. Okay, so at uh, this point this morning, uh, we are at 53.7%. Uh, so we have a valid vote, meaning we were over the 50% quorum requirement. Um, this compares on a day-to-day -day comparison, meaning the same number of days voted in the last vote that ended in uh, November. That compares to 50.4, uh, but there are fewer days in this vote. It's ending today, where on the last vote there were several more days. Um, it's possible that we will go over uh, 54%, I'm guessing at this point, uh, by the time the vote is tabulated tonight. Uh, and that compares to 52.8% for the last vote. Uh, just a reminder, the meeting is tonight uh, at 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall. The Elections Committee will reveal the outcome of the vote. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Okay, uh, next update, Rules and Regulations Committee. If I. If I can jump in, because uh, I, I think we have a, a number of uh, guests here today uh, regarding the wake boat issue. If you look at the bottom of the agenda, we included a note uh, that the wake boat issue has been transferred to the Rules and Regulations Committee. Now, what the Rules and Regulations Committee does is they codify the recommendation. So the Lakes Committee has given a recommendation to uh, the, the board, that recommendation goes to the Rules and Regulations Committee. Codifying meanings they're actually going to write the policy and they're going to look at how it's going to be written uh, and the detail behind it. Uh, that meeting will take place on Saturday, January 25th um, at 9 a.m. Uh, here in the boardroom. Uh, assuming that they uh, that the rules and regulations committee uh, comes to an agreement and if they make a recommendation then it would be forwarded to the board uh, and then the board would consider it and vote on it at the regular meeting in February which is the third Thursday in February at 9 a.m. here in the boardroom uh, assuming the board wants to forward it further then it would go to uh, the regular meeting, which is the fourth Thursday in February at 6 p.m. here in this room, and that's when it would be voted upon to be approved. Don't forget that any policy changes require two votes of the board, so they would have to vote on it at the February meeting, and then they would have to vote on it on the March meeting before it, become, before it is enacted into official policy for the POA. So those, it's a little bit of a laborious process, but it's done so, so that we have, you know, we do everything right, uh, and everything is, is uh, all the information is appropriate, the wording of the, of the policy is correct, and so forth. Any questions on that? And Jerry, I think you were going to give an update on the remainder of the things that were covered by the Rules and Regs Committee. Yes, we had our last meeting uh, and we reviewed a number of uh, policies during that period of time. Uh, it was a rather lengthy meeting. I suspect that the 25th meeting will be also quite lengthy. Uh, the first thing is looking at the Rules and Regs Committee and the policies that go along with that. We do have some changes, uh, uh, relatively minor, but they are changes to those two policies, uh, 1.02 and 1.03.5. Okay, basically changing a word to policy, um, uh, from policy to governing documents. So the rules and regulations covers all of the governing documents for the POA. Um, changing the same uh, in policy 1.035. And we also have recommended or, that the corporate secretary should print and update the policies, provide the board of directors for their manuals, and as well as update the web page. Currently it says the rules and regs will do that, um, but we really don't have the ability to, so the corporate secretary will be doing that. Uh, 
These will come before the board at the next uh, work session. Um, okay, other policies that uh, are of concern right now, especially with the vote where it is, if the vote passes, then we will be making some changes to policy 3.02, um, which is the ID card. Basically, we'll change that to activity card instead of picture ID. Uh, any place within the, uh, the policies that refers to a photo ID will be changed to activity card. Uh, that includes uh, 3.03, .03, the membership card, um, and we probably will have something uh, on 3.04 concerning guests because they're impacted somewhat. Um, and then uh, the last item of importance is that the committee has recommended a resolution for the January regular board session meeting, which will be next week. Uh, to be created in a quarterly uh, financial update to be given regarding the distribution of the assessment increase money. Okay, what we're trying to do is, is codify all of this so that we end up with uh, reports on a quarterly basis of exactly where the money uh, from the assessment was placed. Okay, our next meeting is January 25th, right here in this room at 9 a.m. Are there any questions? You can read more detail in the, in the packet. Okay, thank you. Next item is the bridge at Burksdale, closest to the clubhouse, referred to as the number 18 bridge. There's been additional damage to the bridge with the last rain event to the point that we're quite concerned. <laughs> Time to do something. Um, uh, so we, uh, we brought this uh, to the attention of the board um, in uh, December and uh, uh, since then there's been additional damage to this bridge. Um, I'm going to have speak. I'm going to have uh, Keith speak in just a moment, and then I'm going to give you kind of a rudimentary drawing uh, up top to, to kind of demonstrate where the damage is. Um, but uh, uh, management is concerned, and we would like uh, approval from the board to move forward uh, immediately. Uh, normally, uh, at uh, work session. Uh, meetings, the board does not necessarily vote, but they do have the authority and power to do so. And we feel that uh, given the uh, extreme nature of the situation, that uh, we would like the board to give us authority immediately uh, because uh, we want to make sure that we get the bridge removed as quickly as possible. A couple different things. Uh, several months ago, when we had Craft and Hull Engineering come out to do a review of the bridge, um, it, they gave us three options, uh, replacing the bridge, repairing the bridge, and removing the bridge. Based upon the damage that is in that we have sustained so far, re repairing the bridge is no longer an option. Okay, so it is only replace and remove, uh, and if you're going to replace it, you're going to remove it anyways. So removing is, is, is nece necessary. And uh, we are concerned that uh, in the next possible storm that hits us, uh, whenever that may uh, occur, that uh, the bridge could wind up in the stream, and we don't want that to happen. What we're requesting is approval from the board uh, for an expenditure of $75,600. We estimate that it will take as much as three months to remove the bridge, which with um, a large portion of that time frame being taken up by permitting. Uh, so forth. So I'm going to turn it over to Keith, and while Keith is speaking, I'm going to give you a rudimentary drawing to give you a general idea. No comments on my artistic ability, please. <laughs> okay, I, I don't have a lot to add what uh, Tom said. I did crawl around under that bridge yesterday, now that the water's down. 
the bridge is set up like he's going to draw long ways with three sets of piers, crossways, five, five, and five. On the upstream side or to the south side of that bridge, or I guess it would really be the west side, the three center piers no longer are supporting anything. They've been knocked out. Now one of those piers that I saw yesterday, and this happened after the last rain incident of Friday, uh, pushed the, one of the center piers all the way up against a middle row pier. So it's forced up against that. So now anything that hits that is hitting directly on that middle pier. And again, when he gets the drawing up here, you'll have a little clearer explanation of it. The concern with that, the reason I think it's more imminent that we're going to have an issue with it is because now the next event to Tom's point when debris comes down will have a clearer path to start hitting the second row of piers. And we can, we can see on the surface that it is settling on that upstream side. As a matter of fact, after this rain event, there are joints of the railing that had already started to buckle a little bit. Now there's a new chunk of concrete that's been popped out, which logically would tell you that it's pinching together as it settles and breaking the concrete. So it is moving at some level. To me, it's inevitable that it is going to come down. It's just a matter of when. So um, the other thing I would point out, uh, we have our irrigation line across there that we have isolate, can isolate so we can take it off. It will not affect us being able to irrigate either golf course. The Burksdale 9 should be reopened and Kingswood because we have pump houses on each side. It was just a safety net, if you will, that if we lost one pump house, we could transfer water. We would no longer be able to do that once the bridge is down. So we're ready for that part. Uh, the other thing is wastewater's uh, sewer line is on that bridge, and we have talked to them several times, sent them a letter. They were out yesterday uh, investigating, and they've started the process to try to bore underneath the creek uh, uh, and, and move their sewer line off our bridge because we told them at some point that bridge will either be removed by us or by Mother Nature. So that's where I'm at. So, Tom, you could probably show in the picture what I talked about. So a reminder, no comments on my artistic ability. So here's the bridge. This is the land. This is the water. And this is the flow of the water. The arrows indicate the flow of the water. These little dots are the piers that are supporting the bridge. So there are 15 piers supporting the bridge. And right now, those three are out of commission. And this pier is shoved up against that pier. Uh, so our concern is that, that the next rain that comes through is going to knock out this one uh, and we could have a bridge in the water if we don't get this out in a reasonable amount of time. When I crawled under, this is where the old 18 was, so I crawled down here to look under so I could get a line of sight here. What I discovered is back in the, used to be in the bank, behind a riprap, there's a set of three piers here that are now exposed as well. So that's right at the edge where that car pad joins the bridge. I didn't know those were there. You couldn't see them. But it's eating back underneath the ramp. And these piers are now exposed. There's one here, one here, one here that were in the soil where you couldn't see them. Now you can see them. I'm assuming the same thing is on the other end, but I, I didn't see anything down there. Any questions? Um, may you I do think, Steve? May I ask a simple question? I have noticed on a number of our bridges that we are not doing proper maintenance and cleanup, which causes excessive stress on bridges. Uh, we collect tree trunks and debris at the base of the bridge. Looks like it sits there for many months. Um, is anybody in charge of making sure that those things are cleaned up so that we don't knock other bridges down? I will address that. Uh, we remove 
debris up against the bridge. We've done that on all the bridge. The only piece of debris right now that we haven't removed, we were just talking about a while ago, is on the bridge at Kingswood. There's a tree underneath there that we're working on getting out. But all the arch bridges don't have any debris under them. And we remove the debris as soon as we can get a piece of equipment in there safely. Right now, there's no debris up against any bridge that I'm aware of other than 18 and that one that I'm talking about at uh, Kingswood. And so you're aware, um, we had equipment on that bridge uh, removing debris when we found out that the initial pier was gone and we got the equipment off that bridge. It, getting it from the top is, is the, the quickest and most effective way to, to remove it. Uh, but now we can't put heavy equipment on that bridge and that's when we lost one pier now we're down three piers um, now it, Keith was speaking with a uh, contractor and Keith you jump in if I misquote you in any way uh, we fully agree that the that it's best to have a clear path but now that we're down three piers if anything the the contractor that Keith spoke with felt that in the very short term that that uh, debris actually may help shield the other piers for right now because uh, if it was a clear flow and during the next storm if we had a uh, log hit that sent middle the middle middle in the right way that we could be in trouble right now the debris is stacked in right here Water is going by on this side. There's a 36 inch diameter tree with a stump that's up against those piers right now. So it actually is shielding the piers from a direct hit. I'm not suggesting that that's, that's not the reason it's still there. We just had no way to get it out with our equipment. Okay. I have a question. Question, go ahead. Did the uh, village wastewater, I guess, is the, one, the owner of the pipe, did they give an estimate on their time to remove it? Or village, waste, it? village wastewater was out there yesterday. They found the, their old line that used to be under the creek and they thought maybe that was just abandoned for convenience so they checked it to see if it was usable it was not so today they have their boring machine out there and they're attempting to put a bore to put a new line under the creek and get it off the bridge if they hit rock they will not be able to do it with their machine then they would be required to get a contractor which would delay the process if they can get their machine to bore under there by the end of the week or early next week they should have theirs uh, repositioned. So anywhere from one week to four weeks that they'll be uh, out of there? The long end, if they have to get an outside contractor, I, I would have no idea how long that would take. And then you mentioned some erosion going on. Once the bridge is removed, can you speak to any further erosion or if we need to put riprap or what's the process there? My guess is once you see the contract or the work they're going to do, they will address the edges where they take it out and probably add to the riprap that's on each side would be my guess. Okay, one point that um, point of information, village wastewater is not part of the POA and it is not part of the city. So I know I've encountered a little bit of confusion about that out and about so just make that point so any discussion about this well in reading the uh, report here Keith um, you didn't you, you had it in the report but you didn't speak to the other bridges at uh, Burksdale the other two to the south that are not in use anymore yes um, those bridges are abandoned there they are marked off uh, there is a little bit to the gentleman's point back there there's a little bit of debris under the one that's now behind currently number two uh, it's not under the bridge it's to the side so the water's still going under like it's supposed to um, we may 
if y'all, the board approves taking this down, when we get a contractor out, we may ask them while they're here what additional cost it would be to take the one down behind two, the new two, uh, because there may be some cost savings with that and it may be worthwhile. Uh, the other one is which is over further toward Harps. That bridge is not damaged necessarily. It just has the railings off and that's why we have it blocked and there's no trees under it. That bridge also has a sewer line on it that we have not talked to them about. So if that bridge ever needs to come down, they will also have to address that issue there. Is that also village wastewater? Yes, all of that stuff is village wastewater. Is there a sense we should just ask them to remove all of their pipes from our bridges? We could do that. Keith, is there any reason that we would want to keep that bridge over close to the maintenance facility, close to the barn hole? Uh, it makes it a little more convenient to get across there to maintain maintain that property, whatever's done in there. It may be of a benefit to, depending on what people decide to use, what we decide to use that for. It's not necessary to have to get onto the other side because we have the arch bridge that's by the bathroom. Well, maybe in consideration of the financial considerations, we just kind of let that one sit for now. It, it, it would add substantially to the cost. It's a pretty good sized bridge. And to Steve's point, you know, it's something that we can consider. We'll talk about it, whether we want to ask Village Wastewater to, to get away from that, too. I do, I do agree with you, Steve. I think we could tell them we'd like you to get it off of that bridge for future, even if we're not talking about taking it down. It's worth considering. Yeah. Well, is there, is there a sense, then, that once the pipes are more secure on bedrock, what have you, uh, can we just abandon the bridges and let nature take its course? Is that a choice here? Well, that's what that's what we're doing right now, and that's uh, well, probably not, not the, years. Yeah, for those for the other two, quite well, possibly. I mean, all of them. Eighteen. The problem with eighteen is I cannot get in there easily to get that debris off, and I just don't think we want that debris to continue to pack in there. Frankly, I don't think it's a good idea that we just push it down the road, let the bridge fall into the river either. I'm not sure it would cost more or less to take it out. I can't answer that question but I don't think it would be our best choice I do I don't think that uh, DEQ uh, Arkansas Department of Mine and Quality would want us to consciously abandon a bridge knowing that it's probably in the near term going to go into the stream bed that's and this is a public meeting with minutes taken and recordings um, I think it is in the the POA's best interest to have that uh, uh, bridge removed in a professional manner with all the necessary permits in place. Okay, so I guess the question is not yet whether we want to remove the number 18 bridge. It's do we want to include the one behind number two? I get a sense of that, Tom. Well, uh, we're going to know a lot more about our financial position tonight. We don't know uh, what it looks like now. Um, we definitely uh, have a little bit of time in that we can, uh, uh, if they, if the board wanted to add the additional bridge to save twenty thousand dollars. So let me let me talk about that. Um, the estimate that we received uh, from Craft and Tull said. Craft and Tall Engineering said that if we remove both of the abandoned bridges, uh, that it would cost a total of $131,200, but we would save $20,000. So, uh, but with the other bridge, it is in not in as dire condition. Uh, we are not aware of any piers at this time that are are uh, have been lost. Uh, they all look reasonably good but keep in mind that both bridges were built at about the same time uh, and you can't see what's occurring under the water 
So it is possible that the other bridge could, you know, the piers underneath the water could be undermined and we don't know that. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, that bridge is probably going to be stable and could potentially be stable for years. Um, $20,000 is a pretty significant savings if you do both at the same time. David? Well, for, for my money and our money, because it's going to be tight either way, whether or not the assessment passes, I think we ought to just deal with the one on 18, leave the other one there, uh, you know, if we, because we need to make that decision today. Mm -hmm. I think in order to get this thing going as quickly as possible. And let's say on the long shot that the assessment does pass, we could go back to that contractor after the fact or, you know, it, in the next few weeks even, before it's even done. Mm -hmm. So we might be able to still save the 20000 but I think for today the best thing is, because the one over there behind number two, yeah, I've been over there and looked at it, and it doesn't look like, like you said, though, you don't know whether it's going to fall or not. And in that case, I'd say kind of who cares, let's get this one out of the way before we do have a problem. I agree. So I'm, I'm leaning for just taking out the 18 bridge. Now, is in the report, are you asking us to, are you asking us to uh, approve the, uh, the demolition cost or to get bids or to get permits or all of it? Uh, we are asking the board to approve uh, $75,600 uh, for the uh, management to move forward with the removal of the Berks 18. That's what we're specifically asking for. Okay, so to uh, suspend uh, any uh, bids then? No. No, uh, what we would do is get the contractor to write up a report of what has to be done. These are the permits we have to have. They're in place and pay for that. And then go out for three bids as per our uh, POA policy. So we have to have the engineer's plan, permitting in place, and then we can go out to bid to have it removed. Okay. But I I think Jim, what you're, I think you're jumping ahead, and I think that's really smart. Um, if we can't get multiple bids, because this is a very specific type of task, it is possible that we may not be able to get three bids, and we would prefer to not have to. You know, I think time is of the essence, um, and I would prefer not to have to come back to the board if we are only able to get two bids um, so if so I think that's what you're maybe what you were hitting on and I think that's wise because um, I, I think we need to move forward with all all speed because uh, I'd hate to be in a position where one week before the bridge was going to be come down we get the rainstorm that yeah. puts it into the stream bed wow. and, and the one other thing that I want to point out is uh, remember in three months is when we get heavy rain and so um, we want that bridge down. One, yeah. one final thing I want to point out about the bid, about the bid process is by, there's $5,000 in the money you're approving to do the letting, which is going out to bid in the papers and doing all that and, and Craft and Tall doing that. They have way more contacts with contractors than we would. So it's much more likely that they'll be able to get three bids by using that. That's what I would say. Tia, did you have a question? I do. Can you hear me? Yes. I totally understand that we have got to take care of this bridge right now. It's a condition that we've just faced with and we have to move forward. I don't think that the result of the assessment in any way affects our decision to move the bridge because we're not going to have money immediately if this passes. So I think the, the main point that needs to be discussed is we need to move this forward, we need to get the bridge gone, but we don't have the money for it. I'm in support of moving that if we know that that is not going to be money borrowed from the water, that it's going to be something found from the budget, and I would to request in the invoice from Craft and Coal done so we can understand what is being spent on permit, what agencies are required for those permits. With that information, I feel comfortable moving forward. So we're looking for more detail on the 
uh, proposal to remove it for the 75 6 is that what you're asking I'm sorry I didn't hear you you were Tia you were breaking up a little bit we had a little trouble understanding were you asking that we get uh, more detail on the proposal before we vote on it no not at all I believe we should move forward but I do think that the board should be able to see the invoice of what craft and told is going to be spent as well as Tom I want to ensure that this is not going to be money from the water department this is money that will have to be found from our current budget yeah and if you recall in the uh, December uh, uh, memo that was given to the board it did include all the detail from craft and tull the, the current packet does not but it was provided to the board uh, what uh, Keith and I have talked about the financial portion of it um, and uh, at this point so we're, so we're we're at, we're at a little bit of fork in the road with regards to the assessment increase but Keith has said that uh, uh, at least preliminarily He's going to find the money in his operating budget. He's not really thrilled about that because the operating budget is extremely tight. But on the level of priority, this is very high. Uh, now, if the assessment increase uh, were to pass, uh, the board is going to have to relook at what the budget looks like. Um, are, is the board going to go with the past budget uh, that was already developed? Is, it, are, is the board going to go with a modification, uh, something to that nature? Um, so let's assume that the assessment does not get approved, uh, then, uh, which would be the worst case scenario, then Keith would find the 75600 in his own budget. So uh, we think that's pretty good, but recognize that you are going to see an impact on the quality of the golf course conditions. His, his budget is already tight. Okay. Thank you. Question. We're already maintaining the Birksdale North at a minimum level, or are we still? how are we still maintaining that? We are maintaining it at a minimum level but there is additional savings if we decide that we're not going to reopen because we're still having to do the things like pre-emerge and take care of the greens that would we could save that money and that you know if if we're doing the bridge on 18 burksdale 18 burksdale, burksdale should be the budget i would hope that we could find the money because i don't see why we'd want to pull down scottsdale or any of the other ones but we'll do what we need to do to find that money that's kind of where I was going with that. It's, you know, we're not using that nine anyway. We might as well either uh, go to the least, very least. I mean, no chemicals. If we have to mow it once in a while, but spend no money on chemicals, save that money and put it toward the demolition of that bridge. Uh, and sometime in the near future, we're going to have to make a decision whether or not we even consider opening that golf, that nine holes ever again. What happens to us if tomorrow there's a massive rainfall on that bridge collapses uh, we will probably be on the phone with the Department of Environmental Quality that same day um, and we will uh, be bringing in engineers um, and contractors to get the remove the bridge removed uh, but uh, it's it's in our best interest to for us to remove the bridge and not for nature because because we're going to end up doing it anyway, Mary. And we, one way or another. We also think it, it's going to cost more uh, to remove collapses. from the stream. Um, I mean, that's a hard estimate to you know go to a contractor and say, okay, how much is it going to cost to remove the bridge now, and how much is it going to cost if it's in the stream bed? Um, Are there any fines that might be imposed if it's in the stream what, bed? What was the question? If the bridge collapses. Tomorrow. Well. What I would say in my experience with agencies in the past is that if you have a, a natural emergency and it knocks something down, they're going to let you start doing the cleanup and then you're going to still have to get the permit, but they are not going to make you wait while you do that. Now, since it's not in the creek, they'd like to go through the process would be my guess. How many of our pier bridges 
carry wastewater pipes or whatever you call them? Two. Okay. So there aren't any others that we ought to be thinking about telling them. Well, and that's what Steve was talking about a yeah. few minutes ago is 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 uh, the board taking the consideration of going back to wastewater and asking them to remove all on both you know, of them on both of them uh, it, at least on the other one it would be they would have more time you know we yeah. could give them a, more time where this one we're we're really pushing them as much as possible to get it off as I just didn't know if there were other bridges on other courses that might have the same issue. Well, there are four bridges on Burksdale that have piers. Well, I'm not, I'm Only two about, have wastewater. Okay, but how about other courses? No. Uh, no. Are there any arch bridges with um, wastewater on it? I do not believe there is because they don't go across that arch bridge. Uh, they might be on the arch bridge 18 kingswood maybe i'm not sure i'd have to check that okay, All right. okay what kind of uh, motion do we need to get this in um uh, i would recommend uh, uh um i recommend a motion uh, to give management the authority to move forward with the removal of the bridge at burksdale uh, 18 uh, at an estimated cost of 75,600 um, we the board would like management to get three bids uh, if that is possible but uh, given the uh, urgency of the situation uh, we will relax that policy if necessary if necessary yeah. um, okay Stephen I was gonna make a motion go ahead so I'd like to make a motion that the uh, board authorize management to remove the uh, number 18 Burksdale Bridge by using $75,600 out of the operating budget uh, with the understanding that the three bid requirement may be waived uh, at management discretion. More Second. We have a second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? I didn't think so. I have Ruth's proxy. Uh, we'll vote at this time. All in favor of proceeding? I don't see any dissent. We're going forward. I appreciate that. Okay, that took a while. Open forum. Open forum is next. Anybody want to address the board at this time? Your name and uh, the street that you live on. Or Ellen on Creek Bomb, 50 Churchill Drive. You were to hear from the Lakes Committee today was my understanding. I communicated with Ruth Hatcher three times, and so that's why we are here representing um, the, the residents of Lake Windsor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just representatives, and many of us have been to the Lakes Committee meeting several times over the past two and a half, three years. We have shared videos, ideas, suggestions, solutions, and complaints. The first solution was that to add more lake rangers, which did provide education to boaters and did collect many more fees for the POA, but it did not address how big, how powerful, and how it's too big for Lake Windsor. The Lakes Committee recommendations still do nothing. The current ones that you did not hear today, they were here, they left. I'm a little angry at that, um, but the current ones that you're going to hear do not address the problem and they don't get out ahead of the safety issues. In fact, we have been told as residents that we should go to a no-wake lake in order to paddleboard or kayak because 
the wake boats need the lake. And that's not acceptable. We spent lots of money repairing our seawalls. <laughs> the residents of Lake Windsor would like this board to send the Lakes Committee back to the table, not to the Rules and Regs Committee, but back to their table. And in their interim, until a final resolution is acceptable to impose a moratorium on registration of any more wake boats or bait boats that create ballast to make a larger wake. The 200 feet is inadequate and an interim step would be to require them to be in the middle of the lake as much as possible. If you don't know what a wake boat is, you better go Google it and while you're at it, Google jet boat. Problems associated with wake boats safety, nuisance, shore erosion, etc., have been vigorously debated in lakefront and riverfront properties across the communities, across the nation. As these are becoming more popular and showing up on water uh, waves that are too small for their safe operation. So a more thorough review of what's going on across the nation needs to be done by the Lakes Committee, so they need to go back now. The Lakes Committee should also be charged with deciding what size, horsepower, dimensions, capabilities, speed, numbers of boats that are too much for Lake Windsor to handle, including the bass boats. POA Council has told us that there can be no grandfathering and there are no limit, limits being set. So someone can bring their bass boat up from down on the Gulf Coast, put it on Lake Windsor, and there are no rules to prevent this. Once a boat is registered, the owner can, can't be told that they can't use it, they can't be grandfathered, and so other people can bring bigger and faster boats and put it on our lake. The rules need to allow for grandfathering and to set limits. Currently, nothing is being done, because we aren't doing either. Now, we don't want it to be a no-wake lake. That's not what we want. But limits need to be set as the boating industry continues to build bigger, faster boats that make bigger wakes. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Jerry. Hi, Don Weinecker from Monty and One Mayfair Drive. Sorry. Other questions? Uh, just an observation. If we take your recommendation and move it back to the Lakes Committee, more than likely we're not going to have any kind of rule enacted before the season begins with the larger boat. Is well, at the, la want? at the last Lakes Committee, it was my understanding that they pushed that through so they could get it to this meeting. And now it's been pushed to February anyway. So I don't know that it, re <laughs> I don't know it really matters because it's already been pushed out. It looks like it's going to be February or March. And that's almost too late. So I, I, I don't know. I, we'd rather have a good outcome than, and, and maybe this is another step, but then it's another year. Well, I'm not in favor of moving it back to the Lakes Committee. However, if the board decides to do that, uh, we're going to be into July or August before we have any kind of regulation that that's a given fact so well, what they're proposing now isn't going to do much anyway anybody else have any thoughts yeah what let, let me let, let me echo what jerry is saying is if it goes in the current process which is going to the rules and regs committee and then back to the board in february and a second vote in march this is all assume, assuming, uh, you know, the, it's the, ultimately the board's decision, uh, then the uh, policy would be enacted before the season starts. But as Jerry points out, if we kick it back to the Lakes Committee, it could take one or two months and then we're, talk, then we're into the season and it's going to be challenging to enact anything. So just want you to be aware of the, of the time frame that we're sitting with right now. Just an observation from sitting on the Lakes Committee. Um, it appears that this may be a true compromise because neither side is happy. And I don't think it's possible that people in favor of wake boats, people opposed to wake boats are ever going to agree. Um, we're trying to go down the middle and help 
the owners of the wake boats realize their responsibility to their neighbors and when it boils down in in the end you can't make people be nice no, that's but right. <laughs> we we can encourage them some of the steps in here make identification of wake boats easier which when you take away people's anonymity they tend to be have a little better so it's a step and it's not perfect David if I, if I may Don Weiniger 91 Mayfair Drive understanding that the Lakes Committee has a very had a very difficult task at hand we do appreciate your efforts however given the amount of input that was provided by you by over 50 Lake Windsor residents to your committee in writing and in testimony and in video evidence we felt we feel like we were ignored moving the limit out to 50 feet to 200 feet which is essentially about 60 some yards if you play golf that's a, a sand wedge it's not very far at all it's not adequate I personally provided you with the video of a weight boat moving down more or less the center of the lake in Lake Windsor the wave that reached the shore, which you saw, crashed into the seawall, up and over the seawall, up through my deck boards, feet, several feet high. Anybody on that dock would have been drenched. As an interim step, and I agree, I don't think it should go back to your committee. It should go to this board. This board should make this decision and quick as possible. If you can't do it now you need more evidence then do more tests but make sure the tests that are done are done objectively make sure that all the people involved in this test are honest brokers with no vested interest in the outcome make sure that the evidence includes the size of the weight generated behind the boat which we saw nothing of in the last tests that were done if the test results were came out with nine inch waves correct gently lapping against the shore there would never have been any evidence nobody would have ever complained about the wake boats those were not representative waves that were generated in the test we have evidence otherwise proving that they are very dangerous a child playing in the water with those waves coming in would be hurt if slammed up against the seawall or rocks we have evidence presented to you by testimony from one of our, our people here today Terry Wilson. He was personally injured by a wake boat wake at his dock. Again, you've received a lot of input. This is happening all across the country, by the way, in Missouri, in Virginia, and in Oregon. All across the country, they're dealing with the issue, issue of wake boats producing too large waves for the size of bodies of water with which they're operating. The Willamette River Valley Authority just moved their limit for the wake boats on that body of water out to 300 feet. Again, if you're going to do something as an interim step, move our wake boats out to the middle of the lake, as far away from the shore as possible. They only move about 10 to 12 miles an hour. They don't need a lot of room to turn around at the end of their run. So why not move them out? Let's have some common sense solutions to this. Your again, time. That's, we that's, feel like that's three minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. We feel much. like we are ignored. Please don't ignore us again. And just an answer to your question, we we want a moratorium, so we don't want any more out there until something has changed, and so that we don't keep adding them. Um, Errol Lawson, ninety-seven Mayfair. I live on Lake Windsor. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure going back to the Lake Committee is going to accomplish anything. They've had this on their table for over two years, and it's, we've ended up with what we've got, which is really, you call it middle of the road, we call it wake boat owners one. Um, all you did was move it out 50 foot. I think it's clear that, that probably the Lake Committee and probably this board will never outlaw wake boats because you've got issues with the people that have got them and are there. But I think it's important that we look at setting a limit. We've got to stop the growth of them. Um, 
the people that are, we can't grandfather them, the attorney says, well, let's set a limit. Find out how many there are, take that number, add one or two to it, but set a limit that that's enough for Bella Vista. Because if we don't, the number's gonna keep growing and the safety issues are just gonna get worse and the exposure's gonna get bigger. If there's really an injury or a major accident, the Lake Committee, the POA board is gonna have some liability because it's been on the table so long and it's in the minutes. It'll be another lawsuit if we don't watch out. And the only way to reduce exposure is set a limit. You can't ban them because you probably won't, but set a limit on how many there are. Carol. Okay. David. <clears throat> J.B. Portello, Three Kirk Circle. And this is a little bit of a lighter note, but I wanted to thank you for something. Uh, the decision to keep Lake Point open with a limited menu and uh, during the interim until the events can, is wonderful. And I understand it's very successful. You're making money and you're keeping all of us that live very close there a nice place to be together. Thanks. And that idea came from a property owner. Okay. Um, seeing no further business, the announcements are the special meeting tonight with the election results at Reardon Hall, 6 p.m. The Board of Directors regular section next Thursday, January 23rd at 6 p.m. right here in this room. Rules and Regulations Committee meeting uh, Saturday, January 25th, 9 a.m. in this room. The Board of Directors GM meeting February 13th, 4.30 in this room. It is a closed meeting. Coffee and questions Tuesday, December. December 10th, Tammy, February 10th, we'll go with February 10th, that looks better. Um, Highlands Clubhouse, Board of Directors work session, 9 a.m. February 20th in this room, Board of Directors regular February session, February 27th, 6 p.m. in this boardroom. That being said, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Second? Second. All in favor? Adjourn. <laughs>